Welcome everybody to episode four of the Badass House uh, webinar series. This series is about sharing the magic that architecture can be, and in particular about really large uh, houses. Um, the reason I'm doing this series is because I have uh, one or two commissions for big houses, and I really wanted to apply myself to it um, to create a network and create some interest and also a debate around what you can do when you have the resources and the inclination to make a really interesting house. So we've had, um, we're re-recording this episode number four together with August DeVette, who's here. Welcome, August. Thank you for showing up. Um, Pleasure. So this theme is on, I called it Inside the Cave. And um, part of the reason I called it the cave, or likened the house to a cave, because I think if you do good design, it harkens back to primary things in humans. And one of them was that we did live in caves. It also meant that we didn't have endless glass everywhere. We did have dark spaces to retreat in. And while this episode was going to be all about what makes an interior successful, we've decided in the end to simply speak about light. And I will be going through natural light and August will talk to us about artificial light. August is an amazing industrial designer and he works for Paul Pambukian Lighting Design. So he will speak a bit more about his expertise, but I'm going to kick off with the um, natural light. So the title image is a famous house by Jan Utzon. He designed the Sydney Opera House in in uh, Australia. This slide over here are the themes that I was contemplating when speaking about the interior. Um, but in the end, we opted for simply talking about light. There are so many aspects to making a successful interior. I mean, a lot of it we can do intuitively, but um, I think when you're doing a really big house, you've got to kind of be in control of furnishings, art, proportions, materials, functional relationships. That all amounts to something that Scandinavians like to call higa, which is something that likens to comfort and coziness and well-being. And August and I just thought light is probably the most, one of the most important aspects of that. So the title slide um, used in the poster is Johan Utzon's Holiday House in Mallorca. Um, he was the designer for the Sydney Opera House. And He's quite a powerful, uh, he was quite a powerful thinker and architect. And um, this house is really something that is like an extension of this rocky island. It's made out of stone. It has cave-like aspects. Um, you can see over here, the space we looked at just now is, is this space. And he does a really interesting thing in how he's controlling the view and the light that comes off the ocean. I spent a bit of time um, on the Adriatic coast and the light is incredibly, incredibly intense. And so you really want to control it. So the house has these apertures that frame views, um, but also give you a very primary experience of being inside that space. And something he's done here is he's stuck the windows on the outside of the walls in order to create this feeling of being in a cave. So there's no distraction. There's no window frame. There's simply the glass. And you can see how that's achieved over here in an incredibly simple way. If we design something that is uh, custom and special, it doesn't mean it has to be expensive. It just has to be well thought through. And here you can see the effect from the inside. Um, you can see that you can see there's a pane of glass because there's a small reflection on the bottom left, but there's no distraction to that window frame. Also, the choice of materials, as I mentioned, is that stone that you find on the island, sort of heightening that connection to a place. And then if we look at uh, spaces that don't have any reference to fantastic landscapes, here is a space um, that I've always loved. Um, if you're in London, have a look at this. It's the Sir John Soane Museum. He was an architect in around the 1700s and amassed a huge collection of artifacts and artworks and decided to display these in the back of his, um, in the back of his row house that he bought in London and 
converted over the decades. And he's done some really interesting things um, with light. So he colors the natural light and brings it in as a, sec a primary bright light source and then secondary kind of colored warm lights. Um, the color of light is something really important that August will speak to us about. And you can see how that is achieved over there. And these are just interiors of his house. The slides I showed before were of his museum. And again, um, he is bringing in that colored light around the primary space. And very interesting also are these mirrors that I actually only noticed now, not even when I visited. Um, I think I was rushing through there. But mirrors are another really interesting uh, element of working with light and views. Um, and then we go into a very minimal, minimal uh, setup. This is Louis Barragan. He was an architect in Mexico City. He was a very spiritual man. And he treats light in a very spiritual manner. Uh, but these are very simple shutters that you use to block out light, modulate light instead of curtains. But you can see the different effects you can achieve with that. And then something really important again um, in this image is simply the scale of the aperture. So this window is incredibly huge. It has the two central malleons, but you will notice that the glass is plastered into the building envelope. So it abstracts us again and puts the emphasis on what is on the outside and also the dappled light and shade that come into the house. And this entire space it's almost like a bay from a bigger space. You can see here, that's the living room with the dining area off that. Um, to spend some more time with Barragan, this was the entrance to his office. And he also worked with an artist, uh, Matthias Goritz, and I'll speak a bit more about that in the next episode, which is about art and architecture. But the artwork in this instance works with that light that is at the top of the stairs. And something as humans um, that seems to work is that we want to move towards the light when we're moving through spaces or through a series of uh, dark and light spaces. And this can be seen um, also in the work of uh, an architect in Sri Lanka, Jeff Jeffrey Bauer, who had an incredible knack for achieving you know, maximum effects with um, minimum budget. This was his own house. And simply by curving um, some of the wall edges and getting a kind of hidden light source, he creates this incredible mystery and, and softness. And I've seen this also repeated in environments created by Gordon Leith in public hospitals, where every single corner is curved, kind of the radius of a, of a wine glass. And it creates something very touching and very soft. And I think in healing environments, that is fairly interesting what is possible just with light and surfaces. Um, I recently was learned this book by one of my interns, Simon Miller, um, in Praise of Shadows. And in this book, um, the author, who's quite grumpy, makes a um, strong case for embracing shadows and darkness as part of what humans need in spaces. And this can be seen in this image, is that there is, there is both. It's not all evenly lit and bright. And I think I'm quite excited to see what August is going to touch on in terms of artificial light, because it can achieve similar, the similar variety and an idea of choice. So with that, I want to hand over to August. Um, thank you for putting this together. And yeah, let's go. Cool. Thanks, Dawson. Thanks for the opportunity. So um, my background is actually industrial design, but then I ended up working in architecture for eight and a half years. And then I um, moved to lighting design. And our company, um, we do architectural lighting um, and Paul Pambukian, who's the director of the company, he comes from a um, theater lighting background. So his, um, his whole 
philosophy is very much based on the theater as the, you know, the, um, as the sort of conceptual origin of, of um, uh, our approach. And, um, and the, the kind of thinking is that architecture is a theater of life. And so you'll see as I go through things that that's very much how we look at things um, uh, kind of with a more uh, dramatic and um, um, visual interest and layers um, kind of incorporated into our uh, thinking. Um, but just when we talk about homes um, and lighting for artificial light for homes, um, there's there's two kinds of light that I want to talk about. The one is soft light and the one is projected light. Uh, soft light, if you think about a gl large glowing um, uh, light source, like the image on the left, um, or like um, moonlight or like a, a cloudy day, where there isn't very much, uh, there aren't very many shadows and it's um, and the light's quite diffused. Um, and then projected light as the, the, the counterpart to soft light, which is very much what a spotlight would do um, and what sunlight would do as it would create crisp, um, hard shadows and, and it would definitely, it would mold um, things in a very dramatic way. So if you, if you think about soft light in, in, in homes, um, what soft light does is it builds ambience. So it kind of builds a certain light level um, and, and it very often defines the space. Um, and you would apply soft light to walls, ceilings, and you, you, you would use decorative fittings as a source of soft light. So one can see here um, the, the sort of up light element, um, on the image on the right hand side, um, <laughs> as well as on the left hand, yeah, that that kind of indirect lighting um, method um, is very effective because what happens in a sense is you're creating one big light source by mm. using the ceiling as a big reflector, um, and and that's that's quite effective. And you'll see when you walk into a space like that that the there aren't many shadows and everything is quite well lit and and um and you can sort of it's very clear the space you're looking at um so but if you it, think about it lighting like it's, it's quite calming it, it feels quite yeah. calm right and yes. i suppose if i look at this image on the right um with this incredibly thin and long uh element um with the new technology and well relatively new led like light fittings have become actually really small. I remember trying to achieve this in an optical uh, sensor we did where we had to stagger T5 fluorescence to create an even, even yeah. light source. Yeah, and you, you, the, the hardware is just that much bigger. So uh, yeah. nowadays, there's so many possibilities with LED. Um, and um, so th this is a great way of creating soft light. Um, obviously, things like ceiling coves is, a, is another um, very well used uh, form of incorporating soft light. And a thing like that light shelf on the image mm -hmm. on your left, that's yeah. also a very effective way of creating that. And in, if you want to create, um, if you want to create a lot of ambience, in other words, um, uh, let's say in a in a in a in a fast food restaurant or in a or in a busy uh, lounge in a in an airport, um, then you would light the ceiling, um, mm. and you would and you would kind of create that sort of ambient fill. And if you want something more moody, then you wouldn't light the ceiling, and you would and you would have less soft light components. So projected light is. Um, is basically a light source that, oh, that a light that's projected essentially onto surfaces, very often task light, uh, task areas and focal points. And projected light is great for molding and molding forms and creating focus and articulation. Mm. So you can see the 
a great example is is um, gallery lighting and, <laughs> and <laughs> lighting and and creating that kind of incredibly molded and and um, a dramatic sort of uh, focal point. And again, um, you can have tiny fittings. Actually, if I look at your image on the yeah. left, yeah, incredibly small spot that creates this pool of light here at the column. Yeah, and you know this is where down lights have kind of been. Um, uh, uh, people got confused about the use of down lights because uh, mm -hmm. down lights have a wonderful purpose, and you can see on the image on the left there that that little asymmetrically placed downlight is is quite a beautiful little thing and and mm -hmm. how it's placed there is um uh, really adds another layer and 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 another um sort of aspect to the design of this space um but people have kind of overused downlights um mm -hmm. and and forgotten what they're really good for um, yeah. so i think it's important to also think that even though people might throw out down lights altogether, uh, they have a place, and it's important to uh, keep that in mind. Um, I think that's so why we look at like down lights. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because they can be glary, and because they, and then if you use too many down lights, they end up just washing out uh, the space, and, and yeah. it becomes a blanket light solution like this very much. So. That you can see that in this space, mm. there's absolutely no uh, hierarchy in terms of mm. where your eye needs to go. Uh, yeah. Your eye is going, it's taking all, everything at the same time. And you could quite easily, with very sort of minimal intervention, recreate the lighting in this space to create pools of focus mm. throughout the space and create depth and perspective and and in other words, try and um, enhance the visual interest in the space by yes. minimizing the amount of light. Hmm. Um, so, you know, so if you can imagine that, that that's, yeah, that's, so that's like bad. And, and also what's, what's very evident in this image is that um, the down lights are quite glary yeah. and, they, and, and they're just in this uh, grid and not even a, a kind of, a proper grid, you know, they quite. They yeah, have, I was been, wondering actually. what's going on there. It's not a starry sky. It's not a grid, and yeah. actually, this image makes and, me very tired. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's exhausting because it's demanding that you look at, and you can almost see how this space feels small, mm. in a way, and and how by introducing this amount of light, it brings all the walls closer. Where if you can imagine that mm. this floor lamp, this uh, orange floor lamp was yeah, on. Yeah. And yeah. you can imagine that there was maybe a bit of light over this counter mm -hmm. and maybe a bit of light along the back there by that couch. Yes. You know, if you had like three or four uh, little focal points throughout the space, that would already make you feel like this space was bigger and that there was many different spaces within this space. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so th this method of introducing down lights, which you can see people mm -hmm. were looking at the plan and they just drew dots on the plan and yeah. told them to do this. And you can see how it really kills the vibe. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another dangerous thing in, in, um, is very often uh, decorative fittings can often be quite glary. Mm -hmm. And one has to be really careful about doing that. And I th think the recent um, trend. I think it's kind of um, running out of steam a bit now, but um, the filament lamp mm. wave um, is, is a little problematic in that sense because it can also be quite glary. If you think about going to a bar where there's um, filament lamps and they don't do enough of them or they do them against very dark backgrounds, um, what happens is your eye is constantly trying to adjust between this very small line source and the dark background behind it. And it, it becomes quite tiring for your eye. Um, if you go to the next slide, uh, yeah. So, so here you can see, I mean, it's just a very basic explanation of if you, the, the scale of the light source 
is going to result in the amount of glare that you experience. So if you if you have a very small light source, mm -hmm. like if you look up at the sun, you know, mm -hmm. which is an incredibly small light source relative to you know the, the background, then it becomes quite taxing for your eyes. So the minute you have a, a larger light source like that moon um, pendant that I was showing earlier, then all of a sudden your the amount of rods and cones that fire um, it, in the back of your eye aren't as strained, you know, mm -hmm. and it, it makes for a much more comfortable um, uh, experience. And what one also needs to keep in mind is the background if there's a dark background, then you're more likely to get tired because your eyes constantly trying to adjust. Where if you have a light background, that then makes sense. you don't have that problem. And over here, you're demonstrating the sketch at the top how spots can work if they're somewhat recessed, right? Yes. And also in that sketch, I'm also just uh, kind of uh, emphasizing that this is our visual plane that we experience and if you walk into a space um you know very often what you see is those dots on the ceiling mm. and by just sealing them a little bit you know five centimeters mm. uh you manage to reduce that effect because your your plane of perception um you know ends at a certain point above yeah. your eyebrows so um you know you almost want to get a just cut out the glare at a certain distance mm. because ultimately we are vertical and our faces are vertical and our eyes look out mm. perpendicular to that so, so this is just quite nice, you know? exactly so this is just a quick guide for if you are using down lights and you've thought about where you're putting them step number one is mm -hmm. to then just be very conscious of what what the criteria are for selecting down lights. And um, so I've illustrated in this little sketch here. So the most important thing is to have a shielded light source. Mm -hmm. So this, the light source needs to be recessed a little bit so that if you stand uh, and look into a space that you don't actually see the, uh, the light source. Yeah. And that can be achieved in many ways. There's two light fittings that I've shown there. Uh, the one on the left is the floss cup, which is a very nice fitting, but you get very cheap versions of it. Mm -hmm. And then the fitting on the right, which is uh, kind of a newer technology, which uses uh, small little LEDs, but in a kind of egg crate design. Um, mm -hmm. Those give you the opportunity to have a completely glare free uh, luminaire. And it's quite incredible, um, uh, this product, because you can you can't even see the thing that the things are you know it's um and then something else to also think about is that if you're specifying a down light and you're going to use it purposefully in a space where you're projecting light down onto focal points uh where you want the where you want to illuminate the floor finish or something on a table or something on a counter is that you want it to be uh, a medium beam angle um and uh, so between 25 and 35 degrees so that it's it's not too wide because the wider the beam angle the more likely you are to have a glary um, fitting okay. so those are those are two really important aspects and then along with that one also just needs to look out for color temperature mm -hmm. um, so for a home you generally want to go for 2700 to 3000 kelvin and uh, there's another uh, index called the color rendering index. Um, and very often good lamp manufacturers will, will very often have this uh, index on the, on the packaging. And you want to look at something that's above 80%. Uh, to give you an idea. What um, the CRI actually indicates? So, so CRI is basically um, if you think of 100% CRI, that is sunlight. So okay. sunlight it gives you 100% true um, uh, uh, reproduction of color. So, right. if, so whenever you select paint and whenever you look at hair color, ideally it's best to look at it in sunlight because it's giving you 100% of the, um, it's giving you all the colors truthfully. 
Okay. Where the minute you introduce, uh, the minute you use a, a different light source, like fluorescent or like um, high pressure sodium, which is what we use in street lights, mm -hmm. then that CRI goes down dramatically. So I think um, uh, the CRI for um, for high pressure sodium is like 30 or 40. Oh, wow. Okay. And you almost can't see the difference between oil and blood. Um, you know, and and that's the amount to which it cuts out um, color. And if you look at that Olaf um, uh abstract episode on Netflix, uh, mm -hmm. where he uses that uh, yellow light, um, mm -hmm. which is the same used for the weather project in Tate Modern, yes. and it yes. completely cuts out all color. You know, it actually creates a completely monochromatic um, space. Wow. So yeah, that's a so that thing would probably be something like 10, 10 percent CRI. Mm. Um, you know, so the, the the closer you get to 100, the more truthfully it reflects uh, uh, and and um, uh, reproduces the color. So uh, if you look at something like uh, fluorescent lighting, that's between 70 and 80 normally, mm -hmm. um, and then LED lighting uh, uh, normally it's about 80, but uh, mm. Uh, ideally, you want to go for something like 90, 95, um, and they are, and, and you know, if, by the time it's 95%, you almost can't see the difference between uh, LED and an incandescent lamp. So an incandescent lamp is still the best, uh, has still the best color rendering index uh, that you'll be able to find. So I think the CRI of a, of a tungsten filament is still something like, uh, ninety-eight percent or ninety-nine percent, and LEDs getting closer to it. Um, so then, I think the next thing to to keep in mind, and I think this is something that, if anyone can take away a tip from this um, talk, it would be this one aspect: light on vertical surfaces, um, especially for homes. But I think generally in any kind of lighting we're always looking at what are the vertical surfaces that we're lighting, whether we're lighting a park, an urban square, uh, the facade of a building, uh, the interior of a restaurant, every space, we're always thinking, what are the vertical surfaces that we're lighting? Mm -hmm. So if you go to this slide, so um, this is just, I mean, there's many examples, but the image on the right-hand side, you can see that that back wall um, inside that entrance, yeah. is is lit and and you're also being kind of um, sort of uh, held by the lighting on the wall on either side of you coming into this entrance and if you imagine that that light wasn't there you wouldn't nearly have the same sense of uh, direction and legibility that you would have had yeah. um, so for for because we are standing upright and we're looking out um, along a horizontal plane and you're looking at, at vertical planes, vertical surfaces are the most dominant surfaces that you read um, anywhere, um, mm -hmm. is that if you light vertical surfaces, those, thing, those surfaces become automatic focal points and, and they have the ability to guide you into a space and to guide your eye into a space. Yeah. Um, so that's very important to to keep in mind and uh, very often if you want to make a space feel safer or if you want to make people feel contained and if you want to really articulate the and, and uh, articulate the uh, the envelope of a space then you would like the vertical surfaces so um, the th feeling of safety and being held is very much part of lighting vertical surfaces. Yeah, that's very interesting. And again, we can see how incredibly thin these uh, yeah. elements have become. And uh, so if you go to the next slide, um, so the, these are just a few possible um, ways that one can in introduce uh, lighting on vertical surfaces. So a very easy one is to just simply illuminate paintings with uh, spotlights um, and and in doing so you're kind of killing two birds with one stone you're creating 
that vertical lighting that that meets you at a human scale uh, because that's another aspect of it is that because you're lighting the vertical face it starts to relate to you as, at a human scale much more and the minute things relate to us at a human scale we feel recognized in a space and we feel um uh, like welcomed um mm. essentially so uh, by by lighting uh, an artwork you're creating kind of two things at once you're creating that a recognition of you uh, of your human scale in a space but you're also creating a focal point by um by illuminating a painting um similarly uh, the introduction of lighting into joinery is very effective when we want to create some vertical lighting so light in bookshelves light in uh, uh you know vanities in bathrooms light in kitchen counters uh, once again, that introduces light at a lower level, but it also creates a kind of natural focal point. And you can see how easily your eye just goes to that backsplash, mm -hmm. that splashback for that uh, counter. And that's <laughs> purely due to the fact that it, it is being lit. And this is an important thing, is that wherever you're lighting something, your eye will go to it um, naturally. And I, I believe that our eyes just want more and more and more and more, you know. <laughs> so, so, so I think, uh, you know, visual interest is very much part of what lighting is in yeah. that it allows you to create these many layers in a space that, that, that please your eyes, you know, mm -hmm. you go to the next slide. So here's just a few more examples of, uh, using coves, uh, ceiling coves and, uh, mm -hmm. using elements and at a low level, um, to create that vertical lighting, this bookshelf where you can really see that this, this bookshelf is the main aspect of the space and is really kind of carrying the space. And if you thought about taking the light out of that thing, uh, you would end up with something that's quite dead and, and, and not really the exciting and visually um, pleasing uh, space that it, yeah. that it is through lighting. Um, Another way of uh, introducing vertical lighting is also to introduce wall, light, wall lights or wall mounted fittings uh, onto walls. And there's an opportunity there also to create something that's quite bespoke and quite um, uh, tailor-made. I, I know you've had, you have thoughts about the word bespoke, but, <laughs> but um, I've been trying not to use it, but it is helpful. Uh, <laughs> I know, but uh, but I think maybe a better word is curated. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, by introducing that light source, uh, that wall light at a height that's closer to your eye level, once again, you're recognizing that human scale. And if you mm -hmm. feel like, if you walk into a space that's got a wall, wall fitting, uh, like hotels very often, you, you feel... It's it's got a it's got a different quality to it, you know, and it's really it, it really feels um, um, very much crafted and considered and and curated and, and so there's a very on one level you can you can also change the light fitting easily you can reach it yes <laughs> yes that's a very pragmatic approach yes <laughs> but um, yeah it's always nice to remember that wall lights. Um, in, in the quest for reducing uh, a sea of down lights, a wall light is a very effective way of introducing soft light, creating some focus in a space, and also creating this vertical lighting that will allow us to be held in the space and feel safe and feel recognized. Well, what I like with these images, because of Pinterest and the internet, you know, these images seem generic. And they're all beautiful, but when you start explaining them and how they work, it actually starts becoming super fascinating. Because I look at them, yeah. I don't really, now that you explain how they work and how the light plays a role in them, they become really something completely different. Yeah. So uh, I just put this in to sort of demonstrate how vertical lighting um also then has an impact on what a building looks like from outside mm -hmm. um and and how by lighting the walls um creates this lantern effect 
and and allows the glass to dissolve and allows these lanterns to uh, to sort of pop out as the as the sun sets. Uh, and this is very true for any other space that you would design, uh, you know, be it an office building or a restaurant or uh, whatever is that the minute you light the background, the back wall of a space, then that immediately becomes a focus for anyone approaching that space mm -hmm. or people passing it by on the street, etc. cetera. Um, so this is also a very effective um, uh, thing to keep in mind. Uh, and then some more of the same. Um, uh, and, and you can see that image on the left is actually the same image that I was showing earlier, the, mm -hmm. the ceiling code. And what just what that looks at like at night, night, you know. Um, oh, yes. So, yeah, it's this one. That space. It's John Pawson's house. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, I'm he's very, he, he really refines, he refines yeah. stuff. Incredibly, Amazing. and uh, and and what's what's visible in both of these? Just to talk for a second about uh, external uh, things is is notice the low level lighting. So yeah. we were speaking about vertical lighting earlier, and you mm -hmm. can see the vertical lighting on this uh, image on the right hand side onto that brick wall, and and those shutters or those louvers mm -hmm. at the back, mm -hmm. um, and how that creates a bit of visual interest, but in a very low intensity way mm -hmm. um, and, and texture. But then in the foreground here, this low level element that really um, makes you feel, um, it creates a, a different feeling all of a sudden. It's, it's even more intimate. Um, yeah, and, uh, what you, this is really important um, what you mentioned because you know the South African approach to making public space or spaces safe through lighting is with put big floodlights everywhere. But what that creates yeah. is like you walking through the death strip of, you know, between East and West Berlin almost. Like you're already yeah. a suspect. And this, yeah. it can be achieved in so many different ways, I suppose, if we just yeah. plan ahead somewhat and we informed in the decision. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this again, this lighting under the bench uh, appeals to, you know, you almost have a private encounter with this, you know, so mm -hmm. it very much appeals to your very own personal um, uh, sort of senses, you know, and that that's very powerful. If you can introduce elements like that in a public space where people all of a sudden feel that they have agency mm. in, in a space that that really transforms things. Um, and uh, I mean, I know we're talking about houses, but um, there's some really amazing um, uh, public lighting uh, schemes like the King's Cross uh, uh, redevelopment scheme, mm. where they've introduced lighting in so many different ways and created so many layers. And once again, it goes back to visual interest and how those layers add up to this kind of quite rich experience of, um, of a space. So this is now kind of the same uh, thing I've been saying is that by, by relating light sources to your eye level, it defines essentially um, the kind of feelings you're going to experience in the space. So this um, position from our light source in relation to the eye level comes from nature and our primal ancient selves, you know, cave dwellers, where we were living by nature's clock and by the sun and the moon. And you can see that, you know, if you, if you very often, if you see light coming in from the side uh, horizontally, um, uh, that your brain says to you, it's time to start up or it's time to wind down. Mm. But it's, mm -hmm. it's quite peaceful and it's quite calm. Um, if you then think of light coming from above, like the image on that desert road in the, on the left, the world, the universe and the sun and the earth is telling you work. <laughs> You've got to work. And, you know, the color temperature, it's actually crazy to think about this, but the color temperature of daylight is 6,500 Kelvin. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and if you, if you were to see that color at night, you would 
it would you would think it's blue mm. um but it's just interesting how one's eyes adapt and and how our eyes are very much um uh, relative instruments you know mm. based on uh, what the other light sources are in the space um and then if you think about sunset again it's quite warm it's quite cozy something's telling you okay it's time to wind down um and and you can think about uh, uh, a warm um, light on a kitchen uh, shelf or splashback and how how that's kind of soothing and 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 comforting and then if you think of making food at night in your cave dwelling light coming up from below almost says to you eat and rest um, and and how how powerful that is now if you make a fire now uh, or if you put a, a sphere of glowing light down in a garden space or if you put a light under a bench how that light coming up from below has a a, a magical effect on your mind you know if you think about switching on a light box that you would trace um uh, drawing on mm. just having light come up from below has this completely magical effect on one's mind and it's it's purely because we, you don't really see light light doesn't come from below in nature so it's um it's quite magical but making fire and and having that light sort of shine up um is is quite a, a magical thing so i can relate all of this all of these kind of positions uh, in relation to the eye back to an interior application um, so there you can see the the uplight which is telling you brightly lit space uh, uh, you know time to work or or you know obviously you would use it if you have a large gathering of people but but it's it's busy and it's functional um, and you can see everything very well and then you start looking at vertical uh, treatments of uh, um, uh, mm. using light to treat vertical surfaces, and and it's more calming and it's more relating to you as a on a human scale. Mm. Then, if you look at task lighting, which is very focused, they're very much um, at a lower level, slightly lower level. And then, if you think of light coming from below, like that image at the bottom, where there's light spilling up from that pond, and also underneath that desk, uh, underneath that bench, and how, how, how each one of these applications makes you feel differently, you know, and how uh, I think good lighting schemes take all of this into account um, by mm. creating layers of light uh, throughout the space. Yeah, and and I think, about, yeah, what's so interesting about looking at these beautiful images is one can say, oh, it's beautiful architecture or very well resolved but if the lights weren't there it, it would not be as compelling yeah hmm. yeah the, the light sort of really ties it back it, it, yeah. it pulls it together um yeah absolutely so uh another aspect of lighting for the home is decorative lighting and um all of these principles that we discuss now vertical lighting, projected light, soft light, can be um, uh, brought about by selecting decorative fittings, um, you know, carefully and, and thinking very carefully about what you select. Um, so there's uh, many different possibilities. You can see the, the image on the left-hand side where there's these three um, glass pendants and you can imagine that that space is actually going to be quite well lit because there's three fairly big soft light sources in the space. And then if you compare that to image on the right hand side, which is a completely shaded light source um, that hangs quite low over a table and and how that's going to create a very really different um, experience and something that's very intimate and is going to really draw you into that space. Um, and and where that bowl stands, and and it's not going to spill out light into the rest mm. of the room. Um, and and then there's sculptural things as well, like this uh, image on the uh, on the bottom where you've got like sort of different geometrical forms 
interlocking into each other and becoming quite sculptural element. And um, I think if you go to the next slide, um, there's more of that. So, you know, these things can really um, uh, introduce an element of character and of and and personality into a space that uh, that that's an expression of who you are as a person and uh, your identity in the space and how you like to inhabit the space. So you can really, it's like, um, it's like jewelry. It's like a statement jacket or a nice piece of glasses or, or a nice pair of glasses where you really have the uh, opportunity to make a statement with um, what you hang in a space um, as a manifestation of identity. But it also having the ability to create the kind of light that you are looking for. Yeah. Um, so just more of the same and, and different, different sculptural sort of approaches. Um, you know, this image on the, on the bottom where the light sources themselves are hidden and, but the, the stalks that, that this thing suspends from is actually a sculptural element. So very often, uh, pendants and chandeliers and things um, transcend the purpose of lighting by becoming an architectural element in its in its own right and introducing architectural texture and form um, that wouldn't have otherwise been there. Um, yeah, I must say, in all these images, if you take those lights off, like it would fall flat. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. If you go to the next slide. So I think threading through all of this, um, um, everything that I've shown to up to now is the idea of focus. And I spoke about visual um, stimulation previously and how our eye is just programmed to look for things, you know, and to find things. And I think that's a primal instinct. And, and how by using light, you can really um, uh, kind of uh, take advantage of that ability, that natural instinct, mm -hmm. by illuminating things in a space and leading the eye in a very conscious way from one focal point to the next. And um, this is applicable for going up a staircase, and it's applicable for navigating a city street. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that focus of that painting and, and especially this image where that girl sits with the, the red jacket, how our eye just immediately goes to that. And, uh, and light gives us the opportunity. If, if there was no light there, you wouldn't have thought twice about looking there. Mm -hmm. um, so light has the ability to, to bring your attention to things that you wouldn't have otherwise thought of. So it's got the ability to add richness and color and, and, and layers of visual stimulation that you wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, and then if I talk about, if you could just go back to that last image. Um, so, you know, this staircase going up here where there's this very deliberate sequence of the stair lights uh, cut into the stair in quite a rustic way. And then having that sculpture very carefully lit from the side so that you get this definite molding um, and you, you have this kind of uh, shadow that presents itself to you, but then molded from the side. Just that, just that visual stimulation of, of looking up the staircase makes you want to go there. Um, mm. So you, you travel with your eyes first and then your feet follow. Um, and, you know, I think that as a philosophy in terms of um, creating spaces and buildings that are more legible and more uh, engaging. Uh, light is a, is, a, is a relatively easy way to actually achieve that. And probably one of the most important ways to, to make yeah. things relatable. I think in the constant I've had from almost every single client in the last 20 years is good light. Yeah, but we rarely talk about the artificial light. Actually, only in projects where it's critical, yeah. you know, and the budgets are there and the ambition yeah. is there. Yeah, 
And so in the same breath of speaking about focus, um, I thought to just briefly talk about if you have a garden space and and you have the ability to look out onto your garden space, how illuminating the garden and almost being almost having the ability to control your lighting internally so that you can really draw your eye out into the garden space is a, such a wonderful uh, tool to use and, and how that allows us to experience the night um, you know, um, and, and experience the outdoors at night, which is, which is a really thrilling thing um, for us because we were never, when we were living in the caves, you know, there wasn't such a thing as experiencing light at night unless there was moonlight or unless there were fireflies. So the idea of uh, uh, walking through a garden at night and, um, and experiencing trees and foliage and, and, and plants at night is, is still really exciting, you know, mm -hmm. and, and thrilling and it allows us to feel the night. Um, so I, I, I really want to make a case for if there is this opportunity of looking out onto garden spaces from your, from your interior that one thinks very carefully about how much light you introduce on the inside so that you have this opportunity to look out into a, an, a garden space and really let the garden become part of your living space and draw the garden into your uh, uh, living space. Yeah, it's actually a very simple way to benefit from having a garden throughout your waking yeah. hours in, in a space. I love that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's really uh, the, a big problem with uh, the low E glass that we have nowadays is that um, it's incredibly reflective. So you end I, up I can't with, stand uh, it, August. I can't tell you how much I avoid it whenever I can. Yeah. Where, where, you know, the, the, the glass before that, uh, 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 you know, it's obviously to do with the laminate and the chemical composition of the glass, but it was the res less reflective and, mm. and you were able to look out more where now it's completely like a mirror. And um, mm. so one, one has to think about that too, because it's as much as it's wonderful to have, you know, glass, all around you so that you can see the view in the day. At night, that thing becomes a glass box that just reflects you. And to be honest with you, I don't, I don't, I'm not excited about seeing my reflection at night. No. It, it, it becomes a very weird thing where you become self-conscious. <laughs> and so I think the if one ever has the opportunity to look through and to switch off the light at night and to just look through the glass um, at what's happening outdoors. That's much more exciting for me. That is where that's, we are. So, yeah, that's essentially the end of my story. No, I actually enjoyed this a lot the second time around. Um, yeah. And I think there are four things that I take from this, you know, in lieu of a QA, I'm just going to say what, what I really, yes. what it made me think of. Right in the beginning, you showed the soft light and the spotlight. And it made me think of this amazing yeah. project I once saw called the Moonlight Theater, which is somewhere in Italy, I think, and it's in an old uh, ruin amphitheater and someone designed like mirrors to yeah. light the actual play that was being acted. So I would love to go there when I get the chance. And oh yeah. Because it seems to be combining it seems to be quite uh, magical. And the other thing I really liked that you said was that um, like light can be used to communicate human scale and that allows you to recognize yourself in space, which yeah, I think is really central, central to what we do as architects and it defines for me a, a very successful project from maybe less successful project is how people feel in there. And that would yeah. influence also in how they behave, how people behave and interact with each other. Mm, absolutely. And obviously, like in a shopping mall, it has a very distinct purpose is you need to make people feel good and sell more. But in a home, you want to, you know, connect people to each other and to themselves. So I really like what you yeah. said there. And then, and I think uh, just mm -hmm. on that point, I think it's, 
I think it's very difficult to achieve that um, as designers to, you know, it's, uh, Ioanni Palasma speaks about empath empathic imagination, imagination mm -hmm. and how that going through the design process, you need to empathize with the whoever's in your space, um, who you're designing the space for, you need to really be in their shoes and mm -hmm. feel what it feels like to be in that space. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's a big challenge for, um, for designers and architects uh, alike. So, yeah, and then one of the, also I liked is the natural references. So back to nature. I mean, I always maintain that, you know, everything else is involved really fast, like technology and culture, but um, our evolution as humans who, have to survive as hunter-gatherers in the wilderness, we're not as involved yeah. with our technology. So our technology has to, in a sense, be handled in a sensitive way to still give us those primary stimulus and satisfy the primary needs yeah. we have for togetherness as a group, for comfort, shelter, yeah. prospect, and safety. Yeah. Yeah, it's not going away. Those primal urges and those primal um, uh, uh, instincts and, and needs are, are not going away. And, and yeah, we need to we need to do what we can to kind of bring them about in in architecture. And my last fourth point was that was what you mentioned was low E and what it does at night. I mean, I've always looked at it from the outside and feeling like I can't see in because it looks like someone's wearing sunglasses so yeah and that's maybe appropriate here and there but especially at night that sounds just quite terrifying because <clears throat> i can totally yeah. imagine being alone in a space and then seeing myself all the time which is you know not really i agree with you it's not really what you want to see yeah it's it's really unfortunate but um it's it all, it's also a case to be a bit more judicious about you, you, the use of glass. And exactly. as you were saying in the beginning is that, uh, you know, do you need that much glass? Do you, mm. and, um, and I, I always appreciate Richard Replastria's approach, you know, where he kind of, you know, he did the, he did a few projects where he like completely, he, there's no glass. Yes. He, he just, he used cloth and like wooden things that open and and that's his project and yeah. um, I really that's incredible you know yeah I know he's an amazing architect um yeah so August thank you so much for doing this again um pleasure Actually, we don't have Kenneth here who was inputting on the previous session in terms of how you can calculate whether you get enough natural light um, but please take use the contacts here to reach out to uh, August or Kenneth or myself if you want to know more. And then I'm just going to give a shout out to Salia who helps to put these uh, webinars together, as well as Rian, my coach in the UK, who sort of uh, egged me on in putting the series together.